Thank you uh, for joining me today, Francis. It's great to have you. If you could introduce yourself a little bit for the audience. All right. Uh, thank you so much, Luke. So I'm Francis Krauss. I'm a staff research physicist at the Princeton Plasma Physics Laboratory based in Princeton, New Jersey in the US, uh, where we study plasma physics of all kinds, including nuclear fusion. Perfect. So let's get straight into it. Um, obviously, you've come to talk about nuclear fusion. If you could start off by, I guess, just introducing what nuclear fusion is, how does the reaction actually work? And um, how might we get energy out of that? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, we're obviously in a place, you know, where humans need a lot of energy, and we're going to need more energy going into the future. And um, it's great that we're transitioning away from, you know, coal and fossil fuels. Uh, but, you know, there's there's problems with every energy source and wind and solar and all that. We, you know, they're intermittent. Uh, I'm power to them. We should be building as many of these, you know, wind turbines and solar panels as, as possible. But when you en envision, you know, kind of a futuristic plan for humanity, for, for what's power going to look like in, you know, 2050, 2100, 2150 with space travel, all this, you need some kind of source that's really abundant that we can turn off and on like a coal power plant, but without the emissions that coal gives you. Mm. Um, and fusion is this, this energy source that kind of, you know, in principle checks all those boxes. Uh, what, what nuclear fusion is, is the, the same thing that powers the sun. Basically it's, taking small nuclei. So you have atoms, you know, made of maybe one proton, maybe two protons, a few, you know, that's hydrogen, helium, the, the smallest elements. If you combine those elements together, you get energy out. Um, it's sort of like they, the way it works is that iron is the most stable element. And so if you go towards iron, either from the big side or the small side, you get energy. So, you know, you've probably heard of fission, you know, typically what people think of when they say nuclear power, that's taking uranium and breaking it down, getting close to iron. But, you know, fission, I mean, I, I think fission is underexplored and, and could be a part of, of the power system, too. And that's, you know, gets political. And obviously, there's a lot of disadvantages to fission. Fusion um, is, is nuclear, you know, in some sense in the same way, but has much fewer byproducts, produces, you know, in a lot of in many senses, much less radiation. Um, and you know you don't have to dig up uranium. You don't have to deal with the bigger byproducts. You just put hydrogen together and make helium, and energy comes out. So that's and and that's happening you know constantly in the center of the sun. And the goal is to make that happen you know in, on Earth in some sort of box that can hold a plasma, which is a super hot gas uh, like the sun is made of, and basically to do the same thing here. Right. Yeah. What makes perhaps this is too technical for the podcast, but what makes iron the most stable element? Uh, this is just atomic, this is nuclear physics. It's, okay. it, to me, it doesn't have to get technical. It's just, um, you know, like, like iron is, if, if you look in the sun, you'll find a lot of iron because it sort of piles up there. Like it's right. not really energy. If It doesn't make sense for the sun to make things that are higher energy than iron um, or bigger than iron, you know, supernova stuff like this that's how you get all the gold and platinum and everything bigger but it just you know people have you, you can do the math you can solve you know what what makes the nucleus of the atom the most happy and it happens to be iron that's just oh, that's just it yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh right yeah that makes sense that makes sense so how do you go about starting one of these reactions if uh you want to use it for energy Totally. Um, well, you know, in principle, it's not so bad. You you just take two hydrogen um, atoms and put them together. And if you do that, you'll get out, you know, hydrogen has one proton. Um, that's it's element number one. Helium has two protons. So you put one hydrogen plus one hydrogen together, you get one helium. And because the fusion reaction gives you so much energy, that helium um, atom has it's going really fast. It's immediately in being born, it's zooming away. Um, and so you realize, you know, you have two problems. First, you need to put the hydrogen together. Um, and you can't just do it once, you need to do it a lot. And so we need to have some hydrogen gas that we, uh, you know, we're, we try and get the atoms to fuse together. Um, well, to do that, they have to be really hot because, you know, when you heat things up, 
the first thing that happens is that the atoms turn into ions, which is to say they, they become a plasma. A plasma is just like a gas, but now the electrons and the ions are separate. So it has like electricity involved. It's an electrical gas, just right. like a lightning bolt or, you know, um, basically, yeah. So that, so you make a plasma first, but then you're trying to put these two ions together and they're both positively charged. And so the closer they get to each other, the positive charges repel and you're, they're trying to fly away from each other. The only way to get over that, and people have tried a lot of other things, you know, you might hear of cold fusion bouncing around, uh, basically any way you can get those protons together will work. But the most, the, the way that is really energy efficient is to just make it really hot. If it's really hot, then some of the collisions between protons are going to be enough to overcome that, that electric repulsion and make a helium ion. So that's the first thing. Let's take a bunch of hydrogen, let's heat it up a lot and, and keep it there while it has a chance to, you know, collide together and fuse and produce this helium. Um, you know, then you, then you need to somehow get the heat out of the helium, but that's actually not so hard. You know, the helium will escape, it will hit the wall, the wall will heat up. And then you have a hot wall, which is just like what you get when you use coal. You heat up right. coal, you burn coal, you get heat, you boil steam, you run your turbine, you get power. This, this is exactly the same thing, except instead of burning coal, which, you know, has a lot of unfortunate byproducts, now you're burning hydrogen, literally, and making helium, that's the only byproduct, and then you boil your, boil your water into steam, run the turbine, there's your power grid. So, you know, in principle, it's very simple. Um, you know, the, the problem really comes, how do you hold that hydrogen and heat it up and keep it there long enough? That's the, that's the issue. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what, what are the, so these sort of reactors, um, I tried reading a little bit about these reactors. They seem very complicated. There's a lot of different words. Could you describe sort of what's going on there? Totally. Yeah. I mean, as with any area of science and, you know, kind of futuristic engineering, we develop our own jargon and it makes it hard for people to understand. So, you know, um, kudos to you to kind of getting the words, making things, uh, you know, straight language enough for people to understand. I think this is really important. Um, so you, if, if you imagine holding a plasma, let's, let's, the, the, it's automatically hard because the plasma has to be, in order for fusion to happen, it has to be something like 10 million degrees. Actually, 100 million degrees is really better. That's kind of the sweet spot, around 100 million degrees. You know, no problem for the sun. In the sun, you have gravity that holds everything together. It can get, it can get really hot in there. On Earth, you need to go from, you know, a wall. Somehow you're holding this thing, and the wall can't be more than, you know, a few hundred degrees Celsius before it melts. Um, and you need to quickly go up to 100 million degrees. Um, and the way... So, so how do you keep this super hot plasma away from the walls? Um, one of the, the best ways we have to do it is using magnetic fields um, because magnetic fields, uh, you know, to put it simply, uh, charge particles like to stay on magnetic field lines. So if you construct your magnetic field lines to be in some closed shape, then the particles are on some closed shape and they'll just stay within your box. And if the magnetic field's strong enough, then they don't run away and hit your wall and heat up your wall too hot, you know? Right, so, yeah. so, so basically, you know, there's a lot of words for different arrangements of magnetic fields that different people think are good for different ways. And there's a few mainstream candidates, but you know, all of them are, uh, we, we have magnetic confinement fusion is kind of the main approach. And that's, that's basically, you know, the game of it in every case. Wow. Okay. So you basically have like uh sort of hydrogen, pumping into this reactor and then you keep it in a space away from the wall so it's not heating up the walls. Exactly, exactly. And, you know, that's really hard to do unless you have some kind of, you know, uh, pressure that's keeping this stuff inside. And actually magnetic pressure is sort of, you can, you can imagine magnetic field lines as magnetic pressure mm. that push the gas or the push the hot plasma inward. Okay. Um, yeah. So, you know, basically we're using electromagnets, um, you know, big coils of, of copper wire or superconducting coil, doesn't matter. If we make a strong magnetic field, then you can hold the plasma inside. That's, that's the name, that's it. Right, right. And do these reactors require any sort of rare earth metals or are they quite uh, straightforward materials? Um, well, 
you can you can dig in you know the the thing about fusion of course is that we've been trying to get this to work for you know more than half a century now um and the reason it's it's very hard to do to do this to get the you know your your metal wall in contact with this 100 million degree plasma um and so there's a lot of different engineering you know things that people have developed to um you know one thing we look at is lithium walls uh li lithium is sort of a really reactive metal um but there's a lot of advantages because it's so light so making the walls into a lithium you know a lithium box even a liquid lithium box is actually one of our big ideas at the princeton plasma physics laboratory um you know is, is lithium a rare earth metal not really but you know it's a material you might not expect um there's really not a lot of you know again you're not dealing with like uranium you know the to say again there's there's fission and there's fusion kind of coming from opposite ends to the most stable atom and you just don't because you're going from the small side you're dealing with hydrogen helium maybe boron uh you know some of the small elements that are much more common easy to come by um other another candidate for the wall is just carbon like graphite um you know easy to come by your your pencil's full of it and it has really good heat conductivity and other properties so you know it it all these technologies kind of have to come together to make it possible to do this but um you know in a lot of senses it's not you're not dealing with a lot of scary materials as with other technologies right yeah how do you get the reaction to temperature and then how does it transfer i guess at what point are you going from increasing the temperature yourself to having the reaction give temperature out this is a very good question so what you're asking is what we call when does ignition happen um you know in your car ignition is the moment that you know the battery sort of works to get things going and then the gasoline engine takes over and that's mm -hmm. the ignition point right in our fusion reactor we we have all kinds of methods to put energy in um some of these methods are you know as simple as just having a big beam of particles that just slam into the plasma and that beam you know it delivers a lot of velocity energy that turns into thermal energy and that heats things up you can use radio waves that resonate with particles in the plasma and heat them up that way you can actually by changing the magnetic field by ramping up the currents in your magnets uh, you can deliver heat to the plasma a lot of different ways have been studied but one way or the other you heat up your plasma using these these methods and at some point like you just said uh, you get ignition which is when suddenly the fusion reactions are the most important thing and the fusion reactions will take over and then you have these helium particles that are going really fast and deliver their thermal energy to the plasma and you know it just goes from there so in a in a power plant you would use some combination of these methods you would heat up your plasma it would ignite and in a lot of situations you would just then turn everything off and and keep on pumping in the hydrogen but you know the the reactor it's like a fire it would just keep burning itself right. um you know and you have you have to keep your magnetic fields on there are there are things you're using electricity for to to maintain everything but the heating could be completely internal okay yeah is uh is that sort of continuous reaction something that's occurred is it being uh observed or is it still in research so you know we're definitely in a research phase of fusion um has there been ignition where where the helium particles are the most important part of plasma heating i wouldn't say yet you know we've done we've done studies where it's very important and you know you get to start you start to measure well what physics how does the physics change when your helium is delivering the heat not these external methods and there's a lot mm -hmm. of questions around that um right now they're building um the uh, the biggest fusion reactor that's ever been built in the south of france it's, its name is ITER, i-t-e-r um and that machine the whole point of it is to get to ignition conditions and to kind of watch the plasma as this happens and right. study you know some of the interesting things um there are other methods for fusion that you know i'm happy to get into if you know if you like but 
where you use like lasers to crush the hydrogen. You have a little pellet and you, you kind of fire lasers at it from all sides and that smashes inward and you create fusion on the inside. And actually at Lawrence Livermore in that laboratory in, in California, that was recently done and they created what they call a burn wave where those conditions were present. Um, and so that was a big success. There were a lot of news stories around that. But, you know, the, that's, that's the issue with, with fusion is that it's really hard to do. And so we've been in this research phase for a very long time. Right. Um, you know, it's, it's hard to convey to people like, we're trying to do something miraculous. You know, this would be so incredible if it worked. Of course, it's very hard. Nature makes this really hard. Um, and so, you know, it's the, it's the balance of like, well, we do, we're learning a lot about this through all of the research we do and it's getting closer and closer, but we'd also don't want to overpromise and say, oh yeah, in, in five, 10 years, we're going to have fusion reactors everywhere. Like a lot of scientists would be surprised if it's that fast, but right. you know, we all, we are always learning. Okay. What are some of the advances that have been made towards that, do you think? Well, I mean, over the years, we've learned so many different things. Um, you know, for one thing, I've talked about these magnetic fields to contain the plasma. We have a lot of ideas about magnetic fields um, that, that can hold, you know, most of these are kind of donut shaped. It's just the way that makes the most sense to close the magnetic field lines and to close the particles inside. Um, and you can make a donut simply, and that's what we tried at first back in the 50s, 60s, um, but the plasma doesn't stay there for a lot of reasons. L you know, lately we're learning things like um, sort of adapting the magnetic fields to the plasma, like feedback. So we listen to what the plasma is doing. We, we pulse the magnetic fields in different ways to calm things down and actually to, you know, as, as things are starting to go like unstable in certain places, you stabilize them. Um, and, you know, I, sh I should mention in that point, unstable sounds kind of scary when you're talking about a power plant. When you're talking about fusion, unstable means that the plasma just stops. Yeah. Uh, you're, you have all this heat, you have very hot plasma, suddenly it just cools down and you have a gas again. Uh, right. It's not good. You don't get power out of it, but it's also not, you know, exploding. And, and that's a really big advantage of, of plasma. So when I say unstable, you know, don't get scared. But, it, but you know, working on plasma stability uh, in order to keep things smooth and, you know, what we call a, a good equilibrium is, you know, really, really important. Um, you know, I, I, can, I can harp a little bit because my, my job is plasma diagnostics, which means I like to look at plasmas in different ways. And this is really gets to be complicated business. Like, you know, looking at the sun, you know, we always have more ways to look at the sun. Now we have kind of a plasma in our lab. There's so much to study about it. And I think a lot of the progress we've made in getting closer to fusion is learning better ways to look at the plasma to tell what it's doing, you know, on very short time scales uh, and in, you know, all different and with the slow particles, the thermal particles, the fast particles, every everybody, you have to understand all these different parts. And over the decades, you know, understanding through careful measurements more and more of what what's actually happening in these plasmas has, you know, given us that like you don't know what to do until you see something until you see then you see oh well there's the problem and we just didn't see it before then you can come up with a solution mm, so yeah. you know there's a lot of power to that that's so true it seems like there's so many areas now that are being sort of influenced by our ability to measure things and also collect massive amounts of data and analyze those i don't do you do you find that that's a something that's affecting the field Oh yeah, no, ab absolutely. As with many other areas of science, you know, people are looking towards big data analysis, um, even using tools from machine learning, um, you know, statistical analysis of big data sets that there's a lot of, of work going on with that, um, that, you know, it, I mean, you take a measurement, but understanding the measurement takes, it takes a lot of, you know, computational skill to, to, you know, deal with big computers, clusters and, and codes to analyze data and then to, you know, and understand the physics that it's telling you. There's, you know, people make their careers out of this stuff. So it is yeah. a lot of work. I'm quite interested in measurements and that sort of thing. So uh, what, how, how do you measure plasma? What do you, what is it that you're measuring? Oh, well, a lot of ways, so many ways. Um, and I won't get into nearly all of them, but, you know, basically you can either, you have two options. 
you can shoot something into the plasma, like a laser, um, and you can watch it bounce off the plasma, and that will tell you something. So, you know, the more that the laser bounces off the plasma particles, the more plasma particles there are, but also the way that that light shifts, the, the, the color of that laser shifts a bit as it comes out, tells you about the temperature of the particles. Okay. You know, we call that Thompson scattering, but it's no more complicated than what I just said. Right. Um, my particular expertise, actually, you don't have to shoot anything into the plasma. You just watch things that are coming out. Um, you know, this is a hot plasma. Obviously, some particles are coming out, but also lots of light is coming out. Mm -hmm. And when the plasma is hot, the light is also high energy. So actually, you get a lot of X-ray emission from the plasma. Um, you know, if you look if you look at visible light, you'll see cold plasma. Ultraviolet light, you'll see warm plasma. X-rays, you see the super hot fusing plasma. And so by looking at the color of the X-rays, the wavelength in very particular ranges, you can learn a lot about how the how much plasma there is, the temperature of the plasma, the rotation of the plasma, which is very important. Um, you know, all these all these different things play a role. And so. Um, yeah, X-ray spectroscopy is a very important, you know, one one diagnostic. But I don't. This is my expertise, so I don't want to make you feel like that's all we do. There's so many different ways um, of measuring. Yeah, it's a cool area. I think. Do you see that all the saucer measurements could be sort of fed back into the system to control the plasma? Is that the, the is that the idea? Oh, that's no. You're totally right. And this is kind of. As we go, right now we do research because we're trying to get this stuff to work. In the future, we're going to move to, you know, industrial power plants. And there's a change from like, well, scientists just want to know everything. The more we know, the better. Um, the more measurements we can make, the better. But at some point, it's like, well, what measurements do we need to make sure things are working um, and to keep, you know, like, you don't, want to, you don't want to build a ton of holes in your vacuum chamber to look at it when you don't need them. Um, and so, you know, you could imagine X-ray spectroscopy being uh, one of the ways because you don't have to put anything into the plasma. You just watch X-rays come out and you can make sure the temperature is, you know, where it should be. Maybe you change the heating methods, you know, if there are things you don't expect or just, I mean, you want to have some verification that your plasma is doing what you think it is. Um, one really important diagnostic that I didn't me mention is um, you have a big magnetic field holding your plasma. And actually the plasma also creates its own magnetic field just by right. virtue of being an electric gas. And so what people do is put all these little coils, little wraps of, of wire all around the chamber everywhere. And by looking at the, you know, when the magnetic field changes, there gets to be little currents in all those coils and those little fluctuations in current, you can reconstruct uh, what's the magnetic field and therefore what's the plasma doing. And so that's when you say feedback, that's a really important one that, mm. um, you know, people, they have, they've, they've invented really amazing computer algorithms to take data from like 500 coils and understand in like a fraction of a second, like, okay, here's what the magnetic field is. And, oh, the plasma is moving up. We should push it down. Like right, simply right. stuff like that. But, yeah. you know, that feedback system is really important. That stuff is crazy. It's nuts. It's so cool. <laughs> yeah oh i i love it i mean i could get i could talk about this all day you know it's yeah. <laughs> uh, it, it's it's very you know uh, these are very complicated systems and there's always more to learn for sure for sure yeah i think we briefly touched on sort of history um but do you have any other sort of advances of a you know you say it's been a research area for the past say 50 years or so um do you have other advances that you think were sort of important for the field? I mean, I guess all of them are important, but the, the biggest ones. Sure. Well, you know, I think it is, it, it kind of raises the question of, um, it's a very, it, it's a very interesting time for fusion right now, because you're actually seeing, especially in the, the United States, but I think worldwide, um, there, and certainly in the UK, there are some uh, companies are starting to invest in fusion. And um, with this industrial, like, you know, this, this, it's private money, it's like some of it's like uh, venture capital, but, but these companies are able to invest in a lot of advanced ideas that have sort of fallen by the wayside, because, you know, if fusion is only a government enterprise, like, for sure, with within the US, you know, government system, 
you know, you only want to take on so much risk. And so there have been a lot of smart scientists over the decades coming up with all kinds of ideas that we should try. But, you know, if it's government funded, then the government will say, well, you know, aren't you already trying X? Why do you also need to try Y and Z? Right. Um, and so now it's really exciting that a lot of companies are popping up to try Y and Z, these other methods. Um, and, you know, I think I think there's a really, you know, bright possibility for the future where the, you know, the the deep rooted uh, expertise of the government labs uh, can pair with the, you know, enthusiasm uh, of the companies uh, to try new ideas and, you know, that we can basically in, invest in all these different approaches and you know 50 things might be tried maybe 48 of them don't work but if two of them become you know power plants in use worldwide that will be i mean it, it would change the you know the surface the the it would change the entire nature of the power grid all over the world right. so you know it's it's that's a very exciting time and you know i think scientists have a lot of different opinions about how the different companies are doing, but it's for sure that, you know, some of them are started like out of universities, um, out of research that's pretty well vetted and that, you know, people have a lot of optimism for. Nice. Yeah. How, how does that work? So they're trying different things and it's sort of like a, a gamble whether, you know, this company is going to work or this company, is that, is that how it works or it's like. Well, yeah, I mean, I mean, certainly, you know, if you tell the investors, listen, we're going to have fusion in five years um, because our idea is so great, it might be that great. And I mean, power that would be amazing. If someone succeeds on that time scale, time scale, it will change the world. It's for sure. Um, you know, but then you come back after five years, you say, well, we had a lot of trouble. Then are the investors going to come back? Mm -hmm. So a lot of companies are having success in like, you know, these milestones that are actually kind of side benefits that okay, we're not gonna have fusion right away, but we will have like, um, you know, by by playing certain games with the plasma, we could generate some medical isotopes that are, you know, otherwise very difficult to produce. Maybe you need a fission reactor right. to produce them. And so they'll have kind of a, you know, in, in, inject a new method into the market for, for you know, getting my, medical isotopes and that would be really beneficial. Um, there's a company, Commonwealth Fusion Systems is, is one of the biggest. Um, that they're out of MIT uh, recently. And, and what they're doing is they're developing these high temperature superconducting magnets, um, right. which it would make, you know, it's, it's basically trying to get a cheaper, more efficient way to make strong magnetic fields, like really strong magnetic fields. And that's really useful for fusion, but also useful for all kinds of different things worldwide. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, that what they're trying to do is is really, um, yeah, make those magnets work, and then they're going to use them in their reactor. But also, they're going to sell the magnets. So right, yeah. investors are really happy. Like, oh, great! Either way, you you win. So nice. Yeah, that's a good idea. There's a lot of um, it's a similar environment in biotechnology at the moment, which is my field. Uh, so there's so many startups and they, you know, I think they do sort of a similar thing where they will try and make medicine as their sort of primary product, but then their research might in, be in just sort of like general biomaterials or that sort of area. And yeah, it's really cool to see um, so much investment in science at the minute. It's nice. Yeah. Oh, I mean, you know, I, you can get into politics as much as you want because, you know, I think science is inherently political. Like, what do you want to study? Where does the money come from? But ultimately, I would say, you know, to do a lot of interesting, diverse science research, it doesn't take a lot of money compared to what governments are used to spending on, you know, many things. And so I will always advocate for let's invest in this stuff. I mean, if industry has a reason to invest in this stuff, that's great, too. But, you know, there's way too many good ideas out there to not try them. That's so cool. What, um... What's you? I guess we've sort of touched on it, but what are the issues that need to be overcome? Yeah, so you know, all of the things I've I've kind of mentioned offhand today are are hard. Um, how do you keep a really hot plasma in a box? Uh, you know, well, well, one thing that you have to do is you want to keep the plasma away from the walls, pretty much everywhere, so it doesn't heat up the walls. 
but somewhere in most in in most geometries there has to be what we call a diverter where you divert the heat load from the plasma away from you know away from the plasma out um you know through the walls to to something and and that might be in a power plant where you get most of your your heat out but also that's a place where it's a it's a it's a crunch point because if that part heats up too much you're going to melt it and you're going to mm. you know have a hole in your vacuum chamber and nothing's going to work so um you know there's a lot of tricks that people are trying to play where the diverter region you know spreads out heat more efficiently um you know that that kind of thing where where we can we can deal with it in a it becomes more feasible from an engineering standpoint to deal with um you know i mentioned sort of plasma instabilities these are just like little hiccups that the plasma has in, in different configurations in in one of the most popular um configurations uh which i'll mention one special word is called a tokamak it's a it's a donut shaped plasma device that um the plasma you you use a current to contain the plasma but the plasma also contains a current that helps confine itself and so that's a really kind of tricky idea and it, it enables you to to make you know to build things in a much simpler way but you have to count on the plasma containing itself um and and in that kind of containment you can develop instabilities little hiccups we call some of these edge localized modes where you know the plasma is fine it kind of builds up and then it crashes and the crash is just it's 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 not dying it loses a little it kind of raises density falls a bit raises density falls a bit but when that fall happens you eject matter out into the walls and you know in extreme circumstances you can open up your chamber later and see where the plasma hit the wall and you know see where things melted um you know that's obviously not good because that not only do you hurt your vacuum chamber but also every time you do that you melt a bit of the wall and then all these wall particles fly into your plasma and suddenly you wanted to have hydrogen but now you have hydrogen plus carbon or even plus tungsten something like this and those are really heavy it's like having bowling balls in your sea of marbles and obviously those do a lot of harm even if there's just a few of them so you know those kind of issues are definitely we need to look at a lot um you know there's there's physics challenges and there's engineering challenges both um mm -hmm. and i think it's a it's a difficult thing especially when we're in the research phase you know a lot of physicists want to solve the physics problems but at some point you decide okay the physics is good enough we understand well enough what's happening the engineers need to be you know we need they have different solutions probably thought of in a different way than physicists would and you know leveraging those expertises to come up with a you know a solution that actually works in the right. end yeah um, it takes it's very interdisciplinary so yeah i i'm really just giving you a sprinkling of the things people are working on you know this is a worldwide effort um with experts from all different places working on these things you briefly mentioned the um how the heat transfers from the plasma to the um i guess the reactor to the how, how does that work yeah well so what happens basically when you're playing with magnetic fields you have to have magnetic fields don't do everything they, they can only work in particular places. Like, you know, every time you have a bar magnet, there's magnetic field lines connecting north and south poles. And you can't really have anything else. Like, that's always going to happen. And so often you have um, kind of a, a closed magnetic surface inside of which the plasma is, is, is confined very well. But you'll have what we call an X point, where the magnetic field lines kind of come to a point and try and cross. Um, and basically, when the when the plasma gets sort of outside of this magnetic uh, field line, then it will go kind of down this X and spread out a bit. And so, you know, it's there's there's the way that that happens. You know, it you you can like you can look at the simplest model of a plasma, and you'll say, oh, it it everything should stay in place. But then you start accounting for well, there's some instabilities, like I was talking about these edge localized modes um, that will kick things out. Um, you also have turbulence. Uh, that's a big study in, in plasma is, you know, you, you want to keep things all stuck in place, but you have a, a huge temperature gradient, we call, from a really hot plasma to a really cool wall. That's a big source of energy for turbulence to arise. 
And so you'll start building these eddies and these like very, you know, chaotic, uh, you know, situations that basically is like stirring your fluid. It's like stirring, you know, stirring the plasma near the wall a lot. Um, and if that's happening too much, it's not good because then you're, you're, you know, able to lose a lot more plasma out of the side. So, right. you know, you, the, the, the key comes in tuning all of this because you want to lose some energy because you want it to come out, but how does it come out in which particles? Um, and you know, what, what amount of it comes out, it's not coming out too fast. Uh, if we can tune all of those things from the outside very easily and with a lot of understanding of what we're doing, that's going to help a lot when we're running the power plant. But you know, if they happen without you understanding, then they're always problems. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It seems to be a lot about, uh, kind of controlling everything, making sure it's all consistent and behaving the way you want it to. And then mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. if you can do that, then maybe you'll get sort of a more consistent reaction. Yeah, exactly. It's all about, you know, let's, let's hold this plasma, which, you know, some it's tricky to do no matter how you slice it. Cause it's super hot next to a cold wall. Um, let's hold this plasma and, you know, just keep it as still as possible. But things, things that are a hundred million degrees don't like to stay still. They, they have a lot of energy in them and they can wiggle and they can, you know, unleash a lot of energy in, in small places if you're not, if you don't understand what you're doing. And so there's, again, I emphasize like, this is very different than, than say fission where in, in a fission reactor, you know, you have your uranium and all this radioactive stuff that's producing neutrons. And, and, you know, when you talk about control rods in a fission reactor, that's controlling the reaction, but it's by slowing it down. The more your control rods are in, the more you're slowing down the reaction. In, in plasmas, like, you know, if, if something is slowing down the reaction, it's generally not good because right. you want to keep things hot and heated. And if something slows, you know, if, if you, if you make a mistake and everything slows down too fast, then you just lose your plasma. Mm -hmm. Um, if you're pumping more energy in and it's able to stay stably inside, you'll keep a hot plasma that keeps on generating energy. And, you know, you'll just get a, a it's like having a, you know, a solar fire inside of a box on, on planet earth. Um, you know, it can't, it can't blow up at all. It's just like, un, it's sending out energy and sending out heat in a, you know, more metered way that that's why this is so amazing. You just take out your coal power plant and you put in your fission, your fusion reactor. That's it. That's like the only difference. Um, it's just a matter of keeping that solar fire in place. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's so cool. It's, it's, yeah, I think uh, I definitely like to stay updated in this area because it's it is the the future. It feels like if if it could uh, if we could get it to work, then it would just be a huge problem solved in the energy energy sector. Yeah. Yeah. It. I, I mean, you know, I think the energy sector of the future has a lot of diversity in it. Um, you know, it has uh renewable energy in the way that you'd think of with you know wind and solar um you know fusion it comes from hydrogen which is in water everywhere so it kind of runs on water and produces free energy it's very it's renewable in that way but it doesn't rely on the weather uh it doesn't you know the whether there are clouds in the sky or it's it's a still not windy day you, you can still run it um but there should be room for everything um you know we're gonna need we Hum humanity continues to need more power to grow and that's fine that's great as long as you don't have to burn fossil fuels to get there um mm. you know that's been problematic are there any issues with getting the hydrogen or is it fine um so this is actually you know a whole topic in itself for sure um you know i've been saying hydrogen it is hydrogen hydrogen is an element with one proton but for fusion to be really effective um you typically use deuterium, which right. is um, hydrogen with one neutron attached. It Something like 1% of, of hydrogen everywhere is already deuterium. So you have to get the seawater and like filter out that deuterium part. Um, okay. But that's like, it, that's very straightforward compared to, you know, everything else we're trying to do. And that's, and that's a well understood process. Um, and there's, there's just so much deuterium, you don't have to worry about it. We have infinite deuterium to run 
fusion reactors, basically. Um, but to make, so you can run a fusion plasma on deuterium, and most of the time in research labs, that's what we're doing. You can also add in tritium, which tritium is where, I mean, it's tritium called, because three nuclear parts, there's one proton and two neutrons. Um, tritium is, is a little trickier because it's radioactive with an 11 year half-life. And so, you know, what happens is that makes your fusion reaction go way better because um, deuterium and tritium, you know, they have, you, you basically get, the, there's a higher cross-section for those combining together and producing a helium particle, um, which is really beneficial, but you have to generate that tritium somehow because all tritium that's free in the, you know, in the universe is kind of gone after 11 years, unless you're oh, replacing right. it yeah. somehow. So, you know, I mentioned medical isotopes earlier, like, gen, you know, basically using neutron sources to, to, um, to generate, you know, radioactive elements that are used in medical imaging and, and whatnot. Um, tritium, you would produce in some similar way, sometimes with lithium blankets or other, you know, there's a whole nuclear engineering side to that. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, then you have to, th that's, that's kind of a concern is like, well, now we have this tritium that it's, it's radioactive, not in like a, you know, 100,000 year kind of time scale, like some of cesium or a lot of the like, you know, nuclear fallout type, you know, issues. Um, but you don't want it, you know, in your, in your public drinking water. So, you know, there's containment and stuff with that, um, that certainly is an issue. And that's certainly part of the engineering. Now, there are, just speaking of some of the breadth and what people are looking at with fusion, there are people that want to make reactors only with deuterium, where you don't have to worry about tritium at all. And that's certainly, you know, if we're wildly successful with fusion, then that's absolutely a possibility. There are still more people that want to do what's called proton boron 11 fusion, which is where you use regular old hydrogen, just a, a proton, um, and you combine it with boron 11, which is a typical uh, isotope of boron. I think it's element uh, five um, that you can find sitting around on Earth too. And the good thing about proton boron 11 fusion is it doesn't produce any neutrons. So you would basically have a completely radiation free uh, fusion reactor, um, which is really, you know, beneficial for, you don't have to worry about neutrons, you know, flying through things, um, which can be difficult to deal with in an engineering standpoint, of course. But, you know, each of these things are like a step along the way to making the quote unquote perfect fusion reactor. And so, you know, there's, it, it's, it's just, it's hard to say what we'll have by when, um, but one would hope that, you know, in, in the kind of, I always think in the distant future, like in 2100, 2150, like they have all these ideas of what humanity should look like, like flying cars, space, spaceships, like all these kind of things that who knows if we'll actually have them, but you can't really imagine them without some kind of power source that, you know, really works like this um, as needed. And so on that timescale, no one knows what's possible research-wise. So yeah, it's very exciting to kind of dream big and, and see what happens. Yeah, definitely, definitely for sure. Um, yeah, I think we're close to finishing up. I had one last question. I, yeah, I guess what is the waste from this? What What is the, could you call it waste? Like, do you, do you get helium out of it? Yeah, so no, that technically the waste is helium. Um, and, and actually we call that ash because you're burning the hydrogen to make helium and the helium, you know, it, it's not really helpful if it sticks around because right. helium plus hydrogen doesn't give you, you know, a, the fusion reaction that you're looking for. And so there's a whole, whole game to play in like keeping the hydrogen contained, but letting the helium out. Um, and people have a lot of ideas about this, um, you know, that, and it helps that the helium is very fast when it's born, it's, it's going very quickly. And so faster particles are less well confined by the magnetic field. So you have some benefit there that already helps. But then once you get this stuff out, you have helium and helium actually, you know, we have a helium shortage on planet earth and it's increasingly hard to get. And we need helium for superconducting magnets and um, party balloons and everything. So, you know, it's, um, it's not really waste and this it's certainly not waste like carbon dioxide is at the end yeah. um you know the the thing to mention um is also you get neutrons 
And so that's the neutrons, you know, I've mentioned some benefits of them, like medical isotope generation. Um, you don't have to rely on fish. We use neutrons for a lot of things. And often we use fission power plants to make neutrons. And that comes with its whole difficulty, a lot of regulatory stuff, um, you know. So neutrons can be good, but also they make a lot of things difficult because you're, you have this wall holding the plasma that's now being, if you're really having a good fusion plasma running, then it's getting bombarded by neutrons. And, you know, that causes, it causes things to be what I'd call like mildly radioactive, again, on a time scale of like something like five, 10 years, not right. millions of years. Um, so it's a lot easier to deal with waste wise like that. But one thing that's difficult is um, as things get bombarded by neutrons, it kind of introduces defects in the material. So you build this, you know, perfect container for your plasma and it works amazingly. But over time, it gets bombarded by neutrons and it. it what that leads to is bulge and, you know, sort of uh, fractures and stuff. And so you're certainly going to have to replace that stuff in time. So, you know, no power source is perfect. This is not waste free. It's just compared to, you know, this is like it, it, it's, it's a lot minor, a lot more minor than, you know, like coal, where you have carbon dioxide and, you know, other fossil fuels that this is leading to a lot of problems. So, you know, the waste, the waste is really, um, the, you know, neutrons, it's, this benefits from other sides of nuclear engineering too, where we're just learning more about materials under, you know, neutron pressure and, or neutron stress, um, and trying to make these things work better. So as fusion reactors develop, probably that stuff develops too, and we get better at dealing with it. So, yeah. Nice. Yeah. That's a great summary. I think, uh, yeah, I think I'll end it there. Is there anything else you would uh, like to add? Um, I've been, you know, I, I think that, as I mentioned earlier, just the more that we have, you know, different investments into fusion, we're trying different ideas, the more likelihood that this is going to turn into a real power source that can benefit people. And the more that we'll be able to work through the, you know, problems of stability, actually making the plasma stay in place so we can use it. And also some of these side, you know, these issues, um, you know, with radiation, um, with, um, you know, tritium, tritium generation and dealing with the heat load and all of this. So I would just say the more that people can, you know, support this and be knowledgeable about it and support that governments are looking into it, but also companies are now looking into it too, the more chance we'll have to succeed. So that's, yeah, it's a very exciting time for fusion in that sense.